Hello, and welcome to the first installment of my eh, kind of Battle Brothers introductory guide for new and newer players. Uh, Battle Brothers is a, a great game, to my great shame, I have thousands of hours on this thing. <laughs> and uh, while I understand it's not for everybody, I think a lot of players really would love it, but they get uh, turned off by the difficulty, and rightly so, the game is not easy. Uh, but once you learn some of the basic mechanics and the fact that it's not just about tactical combat, there's a lot of economic management and planning that goes into it, uh, the game suddenly becomes a lot more, I don't want to say easy, but manageable. And suddenly it's a, a very cerebral experience. There's new DLC coming out in a month or so. And uh, I was just diagnosed with COVID so for the second time. So I'm locked in a small room, isolated, and I've always thought about putting something together like this, and, uh, well, it seems like the perfect time. The game has tons of play styles, tactics, ways to build your little band of battle brothers, all the different starting scenarios. This guide is really just, again, for the new and newer players to get experience with the basics and from start to completing one of the crises at the, uh, the end goal. Granted, the game is kind of infinite if you want to keep going, but uh, a lot of people struggle. So if we have a goal in mind of just completing the first uh, crisis end event, that's a, a good way to go. To start, let's look at at least some of the options that are not necessary, but may make it a little easier, more comfortable for you. Uh, under gameplay is where you really want to focus. If you're just starting out, you probably don't want to have this faster movement, um, but very quickly you'll be able to very understand what's going on in the battlefield, and turning this on will save you personally a lot of time uh, in playing the game. These are fine. This is important. If your people are switching their gear around, if you don't have the reset equipment after battle, uh, the, if you don't do it manually, you'll go into the next battle and they may not be equipped properly. This one's also important to have, um, again, economics and some of the uh, other management focus of the game makes a big difference. And time, like they say, is money. So if you leave a city, when you pop up on the map for the first time, you have to kind of look around, you have to decide where you want to go. Well, that's all time is being wasted that you're paying your soldiers, feeding your soldiers, and you're not making money. So it's nice to have it auto-pause right away. That way you don't lose any time. Plus, sometimes if you're fleeing from an enemy and you uh, end up on a city, when you exit, again, it takes time to get your bearings. Even if you're thinking about it and you push pause, if you're a second too early or a second too late, uh, whatever's chasing you might catch you. So this is a nice one to have. If you're starting, you might want to put this one on. Um, I think it kind of clutters the battlefield and realistically, they do a pretty good job of showing just graphically how beat up different characters are. And once you see that they're getting beat up, you can go and check on the specifics. So it's not critical, in my opinion, but some people like to have that on. All right, so that's good enough. There's a couple other quality of life kind of things. Uh, there's a website called Nexus Mods. Uh, and of course, you get tons of mods that, that help you in the game. Uh, make it easier. You can edit your Battle Brothers stuff. I'm, I don't want to talk about any of those, but there's three that, um, again, quality of life, just make the game run a little smoother, but don't give you an unfair advantage. One's called Modding Script Hooks. It's just kind of a basic one you have to get to do these other mods. One's called Faster. And again, at first when you're playing, you may not want it because uh, there's a lot going on, but very quickly you should be able to get a feel for the game and you'll want to go faster, especially like on a caravan mission, uh, instead of waiting forever. You don't get to choose anything. There's no decisions to make. So let it super speed up. Save yourself, again, some time in real life. And uh, so that works for that. And the last one's called Pause Without Conflicts. So in this game, if you're wandering around, especially like at night uh, near woods or something, enemies might pop up coming at you and if you don't see them in time press the space bar in time uh, they, they may catch you before you have a chance to react pause without conflicts as soon as 
an enemy is spotted, and I think maybe like enemy encampments or settlements, um, the game just pauses and it makes a little sound to let you know that something was spotted. Uh, is that 100% foolproof? I mean, if you spot an enemy unit and then move away and you go back in that area again, uh, it won't auto pause because it's already identified that unit. So you can still get caught with it sometimes, but it's really handy just to avoid those fights you don't want to get into. And that's an important part of this game. Um, there are a lot of fights that you can't win. This is not uh, this is not a fair game. <laughs> there are fights you cannot win, and you need to be very careful about picking and choosing which fights you have so you have overwhelming odds so that uh, you don't get beat up. Okay, so that's what we've got for that. So, let's start a new campaign. Now, a lot of backgrounds here. Um, it recommends down here, you can see going on beginner difficulty and using the tutorial. Eh, I mean, it's it's fine. But I think really if you're looking for the easiest overall, the Peasant Militia might be the way to go. And the pros, obviously you can have four extra people, which is huge. Uh, you can't take the experts, you know, the hedge knights or any of the higher level guys with ultimately better stats. They can become uh, much better fighters at the end game. But you can take decent people. And if we're only, if our goal is only to win the first crisis, um, you know, we can do that relatively quick, quickly. We don't have to amass a lot of money, hire the hedge knights, the, the critical guys, train them up. It takes a long time. We can very quickly hire peasants, get them trained up, and they'll be good enough, especially with 16, those four extra people make a huge difference, to to win this end scenario. So, we'll go with them. Okay, uh, yeah, whatever. So the late game crisis. Um, it, I think the nobles at war, in some ways, is actually the hardest. Um, there are some fixed scenarios you have to do, and some of them can be pretty difficult. And there's a large battle at the end, which if you do all the other fixed scenarios and win, that battle's not too bad. But some of those pre-battles are difficult, and if you don't complete those, the final battle can be very difficult. Uh, Holy War is kind of similar. There's a couple fixed events you have to do. And those can be difficult. You don't get to pick and choose. And again, in this game, you have to be able... It's critical to pick and choose fights you can win if you want to increase your odds of being successful. These two events, Greenskin Invasion and the Undead Scourge, um, you have a lot more flexibility. There are quests you can take, but they're optional. Um, if you just go and destroy uh, Orc or undead war parties moving around, if you find their hideouts and you destroy them, all that builds up. And if you destroy enough of them, the crisis is over and you win. So because you have flexibility, these are the easier ones to pick. Uh, we'll keep it on random because I, I don't care. Permanent destruction obviously makes things much more difficult. I would not put this on as a starting thing if you're trying to win your first game. It makes things much more difficult. Uh, for these settings, um, you know, beginner obviously is easier. I usually play an expert. I usually, okay. I always play an expert, but uh, since I'm making this video, expert is difficult, and especially starting out, you could run into a couple of very hard fights that just set you back. So uh, we're going to stay on veteran here. We'll keep these on low and expert. The starting funds high is very helpful if you're uh, starting out. Obviously, it lets you buy better gear for your group. And if you can buy better gear for your group, that immediately uh, helps you s start the game at a huge advantage. And it just exponentially uh, increases over the course of your playing time. So this one is big. Economic difficulty isn't as helpful immediately when you start. But over time, it will uh, compound like interest. And, and ultimately make it a lot easier too. Uh, every time you sell something, you make more money than you would have. Every time you buy something, it's a little bit cheaper. Uh, and that can make things a lot easier. And then the unexplored map, uh, I mean, 
again i wouldn't put this on if you're just starting and you've never won before it's just extra difficulty that's not necessary and now you can wait because it takes a little while to load up on my potato computer here and hey that's a useful tip terrain is very critical when you're in your little tactical battle stuff all right good to know so when we start off there's a couple things you want to do the first thing is just look and see your map is your map going to be helpful is it a tough map uh, and where do you want to start off so you zoom out Ugh. okay this is not necessarily good so we're looking around there's not a lot of water and usually a little bit of water is good especially starting out because if you're not where you want to be and you have a small party you can take a boat and quickly travel to somewhere better more importantly we have to find a loop what i call a, a place where there are lots of little towns and cities nearby where we can quickly go back and forth to get quests to get money and not have to spend a lot of time which again equals money because we have to feed and pay our troops uh, to travel back and forth between them now you can see since we're here we've got a couple places nearby but these are kind of far away and some of the missions in these southern cities are a little difficult okay there's a place we can go there's a place we can go there's a place we can go but again these are all pretty spread out and if we go down there we do a quest we can't just immediately go over there we have to go back up we can go down here we have to come back over here so let's see if there's a better spot somewhere not <laughs> not great what's this okay here's a little town a little town and a castle so you can see there's not where it says relations neutral there's only one thing there you have to advance quite a bit before you can do missions for the noble houses so this one we won't be able to do missions for for quite some time and those will be much more difficult missions so you got two there that's not so good no 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 not so good so I think we're going to just start with this triangle here and just bounce back and forth between these three places. And if all the quests are either too difficult or are completed, we might dip down here once or twice. So, that's the first part. Where are we going to try to hang out and level up? The second part is, when you're looking, there's a couple things you want. You want a large town nearby. A, because you can recruit a lot of better level, better types of troops. Um, and we've got two of those here not only can you recruit better troops but you can sell things for a much higher price so that's a good place to sell our loot they also have better things to buy better armor and things but it's gonna be more expensive the other thing that's useful would be a mine like up here i believe you can see it's a mining thing so you can buy tools here very cheaply so again You've got to use tools to repair your stuff. Every dollar you save is a dollar you can put to something more useful. So when you need tools or if you have spare money, you can go up here and buy tools at a low price, which again overall saves you money in the long run. Now these places, okay, trading, blah, blah, trading, blah, blah. So sometimes maybe in the more temperate areas, there might be... A place that's like a little farming village you can buy food cheaply food in general isn't usually too cheaply yeah but a place like this you could buy food very cheaply and sometimes you can buy a lot if there's a big town nearby and you can just drive up there and sell it and make a profit uh, any other useful places so this place any village living off the forest uh, that's a good place to recruit archers, either poachers, and in this particular case, this game, I can only hire poachers for decent ranged. But if you're playing at a more advanced level, that's where you'll go to get uh, the actual, what do they call it, hunters. Uh, they're much better. They're more expensive, a lot more expensive, but if you're playing with a smaller group, uh, you get the elite people where you can, and uh, it'll pay off as the game goes on. 
So I guess in general, this isn't quite as bad as I thought it was at first glance. It's still a little, not quite as nice and tight as I would like, but like look at these two villages. And if you're lucky, you might have four little spots very close like that. And uh, you can just knock out quests without a problem. But this will work. If you have the southern, I can't remember what it's called now, but the DLC that adds these southern cities, these will actually work out well for us. The best troops we can hire are either militia or the manhunters. Uh, they're basically the same. Manhunters are a little cheaper, and they don't have the same ranged capabilities as the militia. Uh, so really, if you're just looking for normal frontline fighters, which we are, uh, the manhunters work out better. Uh, poachers, which are in general uh, inferior for ranged, uh, they're inferior troops overall, but they've got the highest range stat of anything we're going to get. And militia guys can get close, but not quite as high. They're a lot more expensive, so it's not worth trying to get it. So, uh, so the next thing we got to do is call. We have to call our group. Um, one of the greatest uh, mistakes people make in this game is, hey, I've got 12 dudes. I need to keep them all. I watched another YouTuber playing, and he was kind of showing us his guys. And he had these just crappy troops with horrible stats or uh, very negative attributes, perks. Uh, not, well, what are they called? Not perks. He didn't pick them, but these things. I think they're attributes. Um, your troops use your most valuable resource and your most valuable resource is experience if you've got crappy troops that are never going to be very good and you keep them in your party um, every time you win a fight and you get your limited resource of experience some of it's going to level up some chump who's no good which is taking away from your good fighters that actually have a chance to become uh, useful members of your party now granted you have to have a minimum of some troops to, to be effective on the battlefield but uh, you want to have you want to weed out some of these crappy guys and another thing like look at this guy this guy's morale is 28 or resolve whatever they call it so uh, this guy even if he has better st good stats everywhere else which it kind of looks like he does um if this guy's on the battlefield especially early game some of your guys get hit once or twice and get injured his morale drops and it it'll cascade through your ranks and your people all panic um, so this stat while it's not critical to have a super high one if your characters have a very low resolve up front they're just a detriment they're gonna cause you to lose fights early on you have to get rid of these guys and it's a shame because this guy's got yeah some pretty good stats overall and he's got starters in some of the best categories but this guy is a dangerous investment so let's let's talk about what you got to look for in some of this um the other thing is if we start with all 12 you can see we've got some good gear some crappy gear this this dude has nothing right but if we call out the weak characters we can consolidate the equipment and then give it to the handful of good or better characters and now those people are better i'm not again this guy's a detriment in combat he can't do shit and he's just gonna get hurt and scare everybody else so this guy always at wavering morale it's a, a big negative debuff on all his abilities and stats at the beginning of every battle no this guy's just gotta go i don't even look at the rest of it All right, so let's see. In general, what we are looking for is weapon skill, or for a range guy here, range skill is the most important stat. Um, in general, if we've got people who are going to be fighting in melee, they've got to be able to hit stuff. If we've got people who are archers shooting from a distance, they've got to be able to hit stuff. In general, for weapon skill, something good is like 56 and above now that, that's not going to be on everybody obviously but you might get tricked and see some guy with a low number here but a lot of stars you think oh this guy will develop a lot well yeah every time he levels up he'll get more points than somebody else but he's so far behind other people that uh, he'll never catch up 
This guy at 53 with two stars, eh, is a little lower than I'd like, but it's not a it's not a bad stat overall. Like I said, morale, you've got to have a minimum. I mean, ideally, ideally you want it at 40 plus to start, but that's kind of high for peasants and things. So, you know, if it's 36, because when you level up, uh, that's a skill that levels up between two and four points. So, you know, one time you can put points in there and bump it up to a more acceptable level. Uh, it's not too much of a detriment. And that's part of the problem here too. If you want this guy to be a, a, a good fighter, every time he levels up, you're going to have to be putting points into this instead of points into the more important attributes. So it's just going to slow his progress down. The second most important stat is probably fatigue. Uh, and depending on the characters, you'll be looking for like 105 and above. Stars obviously are important as well. Um, more so for the frontline fighters. Your archers and things could probably have a little bit less, like 95. Um, but because this lets them wear more armor, which gives them basically more health, lets them stay alive longer, uh, lets them fight longer, use special abilities more, uh, this is critical. Uh, after that, it's kind of a tie for your frontline guys. Melee defense is helpful, as is health. And realistically, both of those are kind of mitigating the same thing. Just, can I keep my guy alive? Uh, this helps prevent them, the higher this is, the fewer injuries they get, which lets them fight more. As if they're too badly injured, they go off, they can't fight, or if you don't want them fighting. Uh, which means you're paying them not to fight, which is not what you want. And this, if you've got a guy who's really good with this skill, if it's really high, you're probably going to give him a two-handed weapon, which means he can't have a shield. So he's got to have a decent skill here or he's just going to get pounded. Even if he's got a ton of armor, he's going to get pounded. So it's good to have at least a decent amount. Now, starting out, nobody is going to have a good defense skill. None of these backgrounds are going to. So you don't have to look necessarily for a high skill at this point but stars are very helpful and even if you've got a guy who doesn't have a very high skill but maybe his other stats are high uh, if he's got some stars here you can make him what I call a dude or a tank he's just an average guy you pump this up you give him a shield and his job is just to soak up attacks if one of your two-handed weapon uh, killers is injured uh, he can push them away and let the two-handed guy uh, escape or survive and return. So uh, while you're not screening for this up front, these two you want to look at um, and just help kind of make decisions on who to keep and who to call. Ideally, you're looking to keep about eh, probably your top six people. So first, we have to strip everybody of all their gear. Um, the gear they're carrying affects their, you know, fatigue levels and things. So it makes it a little more difficult to see exactly uh, if they're good or not and compare stats. You can take this stuff off just because you may end up, well, you're going to reallocate things. But he's going to have the, the guy who starts with your ranged weapon on this thing is going to have your best range stats. So he's going to be a keeper regardless. You can pretty much guarantee. Now, this is a crappy one to have, but if you if you know the poacher background, they usually have very bad resolve, and he actually, 45 is amazingly good. So even with this negative stat, um, you know, that's minus five at negative morale check. So if someone else gets hurt when he has to test his resolve, it's at minus five. It's still at 40, which I said earlier is, is good for the starting. So while it sucks, uh, it's it's acceptable. I'm gonna go through. Ideally, we could just use the magic of editing to speed this up. One of your guys, I think every time, will start with a net. I usually stick that up there just because it's an oddball weapon. Um, it's not something that's normally gonna be, yeah, it's just treated differently, so. Good armor. And actually, we looked out. We got a couple people with pretty decent armor. Uh, this is a garbage weapon that's going to just be sold. Oh, there. Uh, 
Yeah, these gambesons and padded surcoats are pretty good. Level two club. Eh, it's better than the stick that you can start with. And this dude. All right. So in some ways, I got some decent weapons. But again, you've got theoretically eight, and these two are garbage. So uh, we've got enough, and you know these are okay. So okay, let's go through this guy again. A lot of a lot of good, but that's a killer. So I'm gonna put him on the probably dismiss. This guy, ugh, crave it. Minus ten resolve, eighteen. Anytime, oh god, anytime anyone gets hit, that's an automatic dismiss. Don't even think about it. This guy. This, this, okay. Okay, okay, so this is a specialty character. We might actually keep this guy. And you might be looking at this and going, why would you keep this guy? He's garbage. <laughs> but, okay, he can't fight. He's not good at defense. He's good at range defense, which might be useful for one particular skill. And his fatigue is low, but he's got three stars in it. Uh, this guy could be our standard bearer, because he's already starting at 49 for re resolve. And all the standard bearer has to do is, well, stand there with the standard. And anyone within range of him gets a boost to their resolve of 10%, whatever this guy has. So he's already starting out at 50, basically. He always starts at confident, which gives him a bonus to his resolve. And he's got at least one star in it, so he'll, he'll grow more quickly. In all other aspects, you would just chuck this guy. But it's good to have a standard bear, and if we can start developing him early on, um, when we get standard, um, we can give it to somebody and benefit right away. Uh, that's a negative, but it's not a huge deal. I mean, you don't bleed that often. 50 is low. 50 health is kind of low. And, I mean, slightly above average is going to be around 57. In certain backgrounds, if you don't know, you know, have kind of set stat ranges. Like the farmer we saw earlier, they get a huge boost to health and fatigue, but they have lower starting resolve, and their fighting stats are kind of mediocre, just like this guy, a day Tower. This guy is not looking great. Because what would he do? He's not going to... His, his melee is crap. His fatigue's already low. His health is below average. Probably going to cut him. Eh, and that's not great. But he's starting at 40. Okay, so he's got 57. 101 without any stars. So he's not going to develop quickly in this and be able to wear super heavy armor, which is not great. But he has 57, which is pretty high for starting weapon skill. He's got two stars in it, so it'll increase quickly. This guy could be in the back rank wearing, you know, medium armor and using a pole arm or something. And he's going to hit stuff. So we might keep him. And he's got two stars in range defense, which will be a bigger threat to him. So occasionally if other stuff is low, he's got a an extra level up attribute point. He can stick it on here. Uh, nope. You'll notice I haven't said anything about initiative. There are certain builds people go for with high initiative and light armor and trying to... Uh, you can use this to hurt your enemies melee to hit chances, uh, but in general, it, it's not worth it, especially if you're just trying to win your first game. Uh, crap. Eh, it's not bad to start with. Yeah, but ultimately this guy is not going to develop into anything. If absolutely necessary, this guy could just be a dude with a shield and just tanking stuff if I need more to start with, but... Ah, now, Militia, as we talked... Militia is one of our best potential starting um, backgrounds because they have pretty high stats, at least you know range-wise, in the categories we care about. And you can see that here. This dude starts with 60 melee skill, which is huge. He's got 40 range skill, which isn't 
great, but it's still uh, respectable. 60 health, 105 fatigue. He's got a lot of resolve too. You know, <laughs> realistically, I mean, in a way, it would be a, a shame or a waste to make him my standard bearer. But he's got the same thing. He starts at confident. This is going to hinder his offensive development. He can't, unless we're really lucky. He's not going to be the two-handed fighter for me. Because um, an average is going to be two weapon skill every round. And if he's got a one for his attribute level up, I'm, I'm not going to put it on here. So it's really going to be even lower. So even with 10 level ups, uh, you're talking mid-70s. Now, you could give him armor and a shield and make him a dude. He's got the stamina to, to carry equipment. He's got the health to, to take damage. Or I could make him the standard bearer. Uh, he's a definite keeper. We just have to kind of see how he develops. This, I think, yep, makes him harder to injure. These are This is, this is going to be a good guy. This guy is usually crap. The only thing these guys do well is they usually start with high resolve, which he does. But he doesn't have stars in it, so it's not going to grow, so I can't make him my standard bearer. Uh, he's just gone. Uh, even this guy. So he's clumsy, right? So he gets a negative 5. He's still at 55. He's still one of the highest rated guys we've seen. Uh, he's got a star in defense, <laughs> but fatigue is low. And with no stars, it's not going to level up quickly. Uh, melee skill, no stars, not going to level up quickly. Health is in the average range, and no stars, not going to level up quickly. Uh, he could, again, be a dude, which is kind of a catch-all category to throw someone. We might keep him, but he's not a good long-term investment. And this guy. Ah! Butchers also start with high resolve. He's got two stars in it. Eh, 53 is on the lower end, but he has a star. Good health. Meh. Meh fatigue. This gives him a little extra bonus to defense. Five is, you know, helpful. Eight. So all three of these guys are meh. We can cut these guys. So like I said, we want to ideally have six. Uh, if you have, the more we have, again, the more we have to lose in pay, food, and I've got limited gear here. I'm kind of tempted normally to, to kind of break my rule and go with seven. Uh, just because these guys are all kind of about the same. And it may allow us to do some more fights and have a better chance at winning. Uh, let me think about it. All right, all right. I think I think we're gonna cut somebody, and what we'll cut is actually this guy. And here's the reason: these two are kind of the same. They've got similar stats. This guy has a one star minimum and a in a useful stat defense. He could be a, a dude that just you know stands on the line and takes damage. This guy has one stat as well, one star in fatigue, which is slightly better right better than defense because now he can wear extra armor he can have a shield for defense to increase it up and he can take more hits because he can wear heavier armor 59 health to 52 and if he's a shield dude who's just soaking up damage and freeing up my my better fighters uh well this is crap this is crap i mean this is okay but it's, again he doesn't have any stars and it. it's not going to be a great stat and more importantly, if you hover it over, this guy have to pay 12 gold a day because he's a militiaman. They, they take a higher salary. This guy is, what, a fisherman? He gets paid eight a day. And again, doesn't sound like a lot, but that's four extra bucks a day, and especially at the starting of the game, that's going to add up. So we'll cut this guy as well. And now we're down to our band of six. The ideal normally is to have three in the front and three in the back and we've got two good pole arms so we want to put probably our guys with the highest accuracy the, the best weapon skill because these are our best damage dealing weapons now you can only swing them once and you might think well this one does 
uh, you, know, you can swing it twice, so ultimately two shots from this do more than one shot from that. Kind of true. Um, the first problem is swinging this twice will tire your people out and our fatigue's not great. The second thing is, well, let's take a look. So this is something that you know throws a lot of new people off. They're looking at the stats here. Oh, this says 30 to 45 damage, right? Well, because he doesn't have a shield, he can use both hands on it. It gives him a bonus to damage. And actually, if you hover it over here, the different attack types, it'll tell you how much damage it does. So it does 37 to 56 to health, assuming your target has no armor. So even though this said 30 to 45, this is 37 to 56. It, it automatically adds in this bonus and any other bonuses you have. It also, if you look here, it says 25% ignores armor, 80% of the effective against armor. So whatever damage you would, you know, you roll between 30 and 45, 80% of that will actually impact armor. And here it calculates that for you. 30 to 45 points of damage to the armor. This is a level two cleaver. If you compared it to a level one, the meat cleaver, you'll see a huge difference. And, okay, so you're looking at that, 45, 30 to 45. This club only does 20 to 35. Even though it's also the second level, I think, for the club, uh, it still does mediocre damage. Because in general, clubs uh, are, are not as good a weapon. Their big gimmick is the fact that they can stun people or attempt to stun people which is okay, uh, especially with low-level people like we have. It takes a lot of fatigue. There's a good chance to miss, so we'll try to avoid this. What do we got here? Okay, this guy's 60. He's probably going to have one of the pole arms. This guy's 57. He'll probably have one of the pole arms. Uh, this guy is not very good. This, starting with confident, will at least give him a bonus, I think, of 5 to his defense. And obviously this guy's going to have to go in the back. So there's two options. Theoretically, we could have this guy in the back as well with a polearm. The other nice thing about the polearm is it doesn't show it here. If you look at the stats on, but it says chance to hit the head plus 5%, which is okay because it does critical damage there. But if you come down to the actual attack, it says a plus 10% chance to hit. So, with our crappy to hit scores to start with, having a bonus to hit is a, a huge uh, benefit. And you can see it does 30 to 50 damage, even though it's the level 1 polearm. It's not, you know, it's the lowest level. 30 to 50 compared to 30 to 45. But the level 2, 40 to 60, Causing injuries to your opponents is also very beneficial. And to cause injuries, you have to do a large amount of damage percentage-wise compared to the health. So even though this is only one swing, and it's not that much more than the Scramasax here, because it's a higher amount, um, it has a higher chance to injure them, which is helpful. And again, it has a bonus to hit. Get one shot on your best dude, and he's safer because he's back here, so he's probably not going to be attacked in melee. Um, these pole arms are what you want to give to your better characters. This dude, however, uh, we can live without him, so he's going to go on the line as well. And typically what you want to do, put your best defensive stat people on the ends of your front line and your lower people in the middle because these guys might have more people around them. And when they get surrounded, they're easier to hit. So you want them to have the higher defense. All right. So you get that. You get that. We don't have any spears, which spears are typically the best weapon to give these guys. They give a plus 20 to hit. 20% uh, chance is huge when your guys are mediocre. They don't do very good damage, but the fact that you're hitting makes a huge difference. If you can't, then the next thing you can do is look for your best damaging weapons. This guy hits at a 50, 47, 53. Okay, so he's going to get our best weapon. This guy will get the next best weapon. This guy will get crap. 
Who do we want to keep alive? Who's the most important? Not this guy. This guy is probably of the frontline people, my favorite. So he'll get the best gear. This guy is probably next. This guy, next, that's the same. And then back here, well, pretty straightforward. I don't have much else. That guy is, your starting archer is pretty high up compared to what you'll get just randomly recruiting. So you kind of want to keep him alive. We'll give him a hat. And of these two, <laughs> different something else we can do we can give this guy the net if the, the sling is a crappy weapon if the enemy gets up close we got problems this guy can easily switch the net out and throw it and we can gank maybe one uh, more dangerous opponent so there we go we've got a, a nice tight little group here ready to explore uh, and when I say explore it means we need to go to the nearby town and look and see if they have shields because these guys can't survive and they can't fight very well they need something to help help them survive and, and a shield is a huge bonus for that so let's see what we got in town got a quest which is good more important and uh, we can make because this uh, a maybe because it's on the medium level and B, because this town is very friendly, they'll actually pay us a little bit of gold for some of this crap armor we have, which is fine. Um, we might get more money for these at the big town, so I may wait. We got plenty of food. You can see it's 15 provisions a day, so we got enough for six days. Um, now double that when we had the full party, and suddenly you've got seven days of food. And you'd be eating, let's say, 30 provisions a day. Well, that's one of these a day. 56 bucks a day. Not a good investment. So, you cut that out. Uh, no, they do have a spear, which I might actually... Yeah, we'll get that. That's a crappy shield. You want to get just the regular round shield. These, I mean, there's a bonus of 10, but it's not a huge bonus. Uh... And you can see it's worth 75. When it says worth for most items, it's a pretty accurate assessment. Um, there's a couple like trade goods and things that are kind of wonky. But the fact that it says you can buy it for 67, that lets you know that, hey, you're buying this for under value because this town's very friendly with us. We'll grab that. We should grab the hat too. You want to have at least some kind of armor, especially on their head. Because if this guy doesn't have anything on his head and he gets hit with an arrow in the head just on random chance, he's probably dead immediately. The hat will at least absorb some of it and keep him alive for one turn. We'll give this guy, see, 25, 35. In fact, that's not better than this, I don't think. No. So we'll give him that. Give him that. This guy is the worst to hit. We'll give him the spear. Now he can actually hit something. You can look. 25 to 30. Not very effective against armor. Eh, I mean, 90%. 25%. Not very much ignores the armor. Whereas this thing, 40% ignores the armor. And this, 25% as well. All right. Let's see what the quest is. Okay. Shipment of goods. This is a caravan escort mission. Now, I don't know where the hell Grubenheim is, so one of the first things we'll have to do is actually take a look on the map. Let's talk money. Uh, 160 bucks. If you negotiate, we need to be paid more for this. It may or may not go up. But every time you click, well, first of all, if you click it on multiple times, you may get pissed off and just leave. But also, if you click this, your relationship with the town goes down slightly every time. So, if you're trying to build up a relationship with the town, uh, if you need the money, you might want to go with this. Uh, my relationship with this town is okay. So, if I wanted to do this mission, I might go for this. 
However, caravan missions are really dangerous for us at this point because uh, there's a, I mean, you're stuck, right? You have to go with the caravan. You can't avoid enemy contact. And our little army kind of sucks. So I'm just going to accept it. The other thing would be, if it said on here, do you want to be paid in advance? You know, like five, 50 gold up front. Uh, I would say no to it. I would say this one. Trying to get rid of the advance. Because if I take this mission and I get attacked by something really dangerous, uh, I'll just abandon the convoy. And if I didn't get paid in advance, the hit to my reputation of town is much less than if I got paid in advance. They, they don't like that at all, obviously. So I accepted it. Grubenheim is about a day to the north. Now I can say, I need some time to think about this. Because realistically, I want to check where is Grubenheim and do I need to go there? Let's leave. I assume, yep, it's this one. It's a little risky. Again, first quest, uh, escort missions, caravans are kind of dangerous. But we're going to go for it. We've got some gear. Do you have any trade goods we might want to buy? No. So let's go and see what happens. Now you can see. Now if I hit the buttons, I can... Oh, well, normally I can speed up. Looks like I can't. Ah, I do have auto-pause on like I mentioned. So it paused immediately because it spotted enemy. What do we got here? Some knocks there, which I can't see how many yet. Oh, they ran away. Even better. Although, actually, a fight would have been nice. All right, so what do we got here? If there's a really simple one, it might be better. But we're probably not going to be able to plunder a location anytime soon. This takes a long time because you have to buy trade items, which isn't just like food or gear. It has to be the actual items like amber and things. That takes a long time to uh, do because it takes a lot of money to buy those. Uh, most towns only sell a couple trade goods at a time. You have to travel around to sell them. So I would not pick that one. <clears throat> Eight contracts. Eight contracts takes a while. And the, it's kind of important. When you win battles or complete que uh, contracts or when you complete these objectives, you increase your renown. As your renown goes up, the difficulty of the game, the enemy creatures become more difficult as well. So in some ways, if you knock out a whole bunch of these really quick, your renown skyrockets, but your party hasn't increased in their skills very much, and suddenly the game becomes much more difficult. I think we'll go with this one. This one gives us a decent weapon, the battle standard, and uh, it will give us something that boosts our little party's morale in battle, which is one of the major uh, weaknesses of, of our party. And 2,000 crowns will take a while to get, but it's not going to take forever. So, we got that one. Well supplied means their prices for goods is lower now. So let's come up here. This is a mining town, so uh, tools are usually cheap anyway. If they're well supplied, they may be cheaper still. However, uh, the terrified villagers means that they buy for less and they sell for more. So that's going to negatively impact this price. Let's take a look. Uh, 650 These are trade goods. So again, that's a lot of money. Uh, it's worth 520 and uh, selling it for 650 So that means prices are not good. Oh, 375 So, yep, it says right there, worth 200 So that's ideally what you're looking for. Something around 200 uh, At a town like this, usually it's going to be a little less. Uh, 375 is way too much. They do have a shield, which is expensive, 125, but it's more important to keep our guys alive. Let's give it to you. <clears throat> All right, that's helpful. Let's take a look at these quests. All right, so going to the cemetery. Let's talk money, 410. 
Now, I don't know necessarily, but it seems like the lower, you get, the less you get paid, the easier the quest is in general. And it's one skull, though. I, this this is not a very accurate measurement of the quest difficulty. Uh, don't ever, I mean, unless you really never have any intention of doing it, because once you hit this, it just goes away. You can always just accept it and just not take it, and it's there if you want to take it later. So, and it'd be good to get this town liking us again, so we'll accept it. 410, okay, I'll think about it. Let's see what the other one is. Ah, okay. Now, this one, the lockbox. So, when you accept this quest, some little footsteps will appear on the map moving away from the town. And you have to track them down, kill. It's almost always... No, I think it is always humans. You kill them, and you bring it back. For whatever reason, the enemies on these quests, even though it's like one, star, one skull, just like the previous one, these bandit armies are just a little weaker than the other bandit type quests. So these are always a good one to take for an, a relatively easy fight. So just starting out, uh, an easy fight is what you want. And since I'm confident I'm going to be able to do this one, I can say this. He'll be unhappy. I'll lose a tiny bit of friendliness with the town, but I'm going to gain a lot more back when I complete the quest. Eh, 20 bucks isn't a lot, but again, early game, it's it's meaningful. Alright. Let's track these guys. So, there's the footsteps. Track them down. We can just follow the road. Seven thieves. And they're all thugs. Which is good. Because thugs are... Eh, equal or slightly less dangerous than our guys. Probably slightly less dangerous, but they're still... It's close enough that the fact that they outnumber us by one is not good. That's why they're not running. It's a relatively fair fight. Now, when you attack them, I believe the type of terrain you fight on is what your party is on. I don't want to fight on the mountains. Elevation in this game is kind of janky, so I prefer to fight them in the relative open, so I'll come down here. Oh, just some random dudes. Ah, we do have some elevation, which will help immensely. Now, the big question right off the bat is, do I try to fight on here, where we can have yeah, one, two, and three? Elevation, I think, gives you like a plus ten to defense, and I thought it said somewhere and a plus 10 to hit. So that's really a good benefit for us. Uh, let's, let's do that. This guy comes in here. He's gonna wait. Again, his range attack is garbage. We'll let them get closer. This guy will wait. <laughs> okay. So, I could step up here, but then next turn they'll get the move up and hit me first. As I said earlier, this is these are our damage dealers, our best weapons, right? So, what we can do is potentially move these guys up. He'll get to step up here, get the bonus to hit, and nuke one of these guys. Let's look at their weapons. That's going to be kind of important. Which ones are the more dangerous? And who can be killed quickly? Because again, these guys have crappy nerve like we do, morale. So if we start injuring people, they'll start getting disheartened. All their stats decrease, and then we can hit them more, we get hit less, and that's how you win. You cascade. Sword. This guy's got a sword, has a plus 10 to hit, and does a lot of damage when you're not, when there's no armor anymore. At least our frontline people have some armor, so... Well, this is dangerous. It's not the top danger. The dagger can be dangerous because it can ignore armor, but it's harder to hit with that. Uh, the fact that my guys don't have shields <laughs> that actually becomes a problem in a way. So he's eh, moderately dangerous. Cleaver, eh. Uh, to make you bleed with that, he has to hit you and actually cause health damage. The first hit he does on somebody is probably just going to affect their armor. 
so I'm not too worried about that. This guy gets the bonus to hit, which is not good. And he's not doesn't have a shield, so he does extra damage. The fact he doesn't have a shield also means he's easier to hit. His armor is not very good. So, he may be a priority, actually. Meh. That dude has a stick that does, like, no damage, so I'm not worried. This guy, obviously, is dangerous. Now, he can only take one step and swing, so I can kind of game in a bit and see where he is. And for... You know, for where we are in the game right now, for uh, equipment-wise, he's got pretty good armor. He's going to be difficult to deal with. So he is actually probably the most dangerous guy here, and it will take dedicated effort to kill. In fact, he may be a good net target. Uh, we're going to pause again for this guy. I think what we'll do is these guys will move down. He'll step down and attack somebody. He'll step up and attack somebody, and then, yeah, we'll see. He may end up coming down here and throwing a stone. This guy probably should have been up here, because now I've got an opening where they can come through. But we'll deal with it. Uh, yeah. I'm going to have to do this, I think. And they're not swinging now, because, again, their weapons don't do as much damage as these. So these weapons will go first, hopefully, because they do so much damage, they'll knock out their armor, and they have a bonus to hit the head. They may just insta-kill them if they hit them in the head. If they do that, I can shift down and maybe help plug in this hole. So they're going to wait and see what happens. Uh, okay. Um, he can't wait anymore. So he's going to come down here. I guess we'll try to hit that guy. Nope. He's going to come up here. Uh, see, 82 is a bonus to hit. Um, he's... Yep. <gasps> Perfect. Now you can see, that guy's already wavering now. That guy's wavering. That guy's wavering. That guy's wavering. They've all had their stats negatively impacted. Now, the bigger question is, do I hit that guy, which could also negatively impact people, or do I hit him? <sighs> if I hit him, uh, again, I might kill him outright. I'll set him up to kill outright. And that guy's going to be left to his own devices. I think I'm going to go for that. I just need to kill people. Bad. Now, they're breaking. Their stats are even lower. And... He can come down here and plug the hole. This guy... Yeah, he only has a 50% chance to hit. I could I thought about shield wall. I should have. Uh, actually, he could spear wall and keep these guys from flanking around, which isn't necessarily a bad idea. I think, though, you just want to do damage and break them. Like that. Again, cascading negative morale effects. Uh, and we'll step back. And I thought that might happen. Oh, oh he's stunned, too. I don't think this guy had a knife. Nope, he has a net, which he probably can't throw. This guy's going to be in some trouble. Uh, we have to kill this guy. He's dangerous. Uh, we'll step here, in case he kills him and then moves forward. This guy... If we can kill him, or miss, all right, finish, finish. All right, maybe we can. Nope. Ah. Again, we targeted the weak guys. Now. Again, the cascading panic has spread. It saved this guy. These guys are all going to run. And when they run, I get to hit them for free. So this guy's already dead. This guy, let's try to hit each of them once. And we hit, we didn't hit that guy twice because he's only touching one guy. This guy, we can actually get multiple people around. So we'll swing him first. Now he's touching him. Sure. <laughs> 
Uh, normally you want to try to run them down because every time you kill somebody, you get more loot, more gear. This guy's got 32 health, so even though he's losing five a turn, eh, it's worth the worth it. Fleeing people go last, so we can run them down. And since I can't move an attack, we'll just go as far as we can. Perfect. Uh, you're not going to catch him. Uh, yeah, you could try. And almost hit one of your own people. Perfect. So, successful quest. Everyone survived. Had a few injuries. I don't think any, but... I don't think anyone got any injury injuries. And some decent loot. Take it all. Good to go. Now, this actually brings up something before we move on to the quest. Two-handed weapons are kind of a interesting thing. So if you look at it normally, it does 35 to 70 damage, right? Which is a lot. Compared to, where's our prong guy? 40 to 60. So this does 5 more for the minimum and 10 less for the maximum. But that's not actually 100% um, accurate. This weapon says 40 to 60 damage. You come down here, it does 40 to 60 damage, but it has a bonus to hit. You take that off, you give him the sword. 30 to 40 damage. 37 to 50, because he doesn't have a shield, he gets the plus 25%. Does it say on here because, yeah, the second hand free. The axe is a two-handed weapon. So it's not going to get that 25% bonus. See, the old stat's not there. However, it's a two-handed non-ranged melee weapon. And for some reason, look, 52 to 105 damage. Even though it says 35 to 70 here. Why is that? I, I don't know. Well, I, I know. Again, all the two-handed things like two-headed swords, two-headed hammers, two-headed axes, two-headed maces, two-headed cleavers that don't have range, they all get, uh, what is that, 105. I think that's more than 25% extra damage. Um, so if you're just looking at the stats this way, you might think, oh, this is, you know, why would I give up? a shield in defense for a weapon that doesn't do that much damage. Well, it actually does a lot more. And if you look at the bottom, it says that little star there. This weapon's special ability is it hits both the head and the body for additional damage. So actually, when you swing this, you hit them, you hit your opponent twice. You're doing a huge amount of damage with the two-handed axe. Now, the counter to that is you never fall into the trap of giving your beginning or even intermediate party two-headed weapons like this because they're going to get smoked. Your armor is not good enough. You're not hitting enough to reliably kill people that are attacking you. You're going to die. These two-handed weapons are only for very late game when your party is fully upgraded and ready to go. So don't fall into that trap. This is lot worth lots of money when we sell it but uh, we're not going to equip it to anybody. Another thing that's interesting is if you don't know, you know, you could, uh, you could repair these items here, and then when you sell them, you'll get more money for them. For this low-level garbage stuff, that's not worthwhile. The, the money you lose on the tools is not made up in the money gained from selling stuff. Once you start getting up to level 2, stuff like the skirmish axe this one's worth 700 gold so if it's at 50 percent if it's damaged uh, if you spend the tools to repair it you get a lot more money back when you sell it so higher tier weapons are worth it lower tier weapons are not worth it armor is almost never worth it, it has a it's based off of the health you can see it's got 56 health there armor has a huge amount of health so you spend a lot of tools repairing it so don't worry about trying to repair armor before you sell it. Just hide here weapons that you don't need. We've got good armor. We can equip that right away. Always upgrade our people. Get that back. Get that back. Again, there's spear, which 
which is a much better weapon for that guy. And <laughs> so the sword kind of competes with the spear, but uh, the fact that it's only plus 10 to hit, again, doesn't say it here, but it says it down here, plus 10% chance to hit. Um, usually with our beginner guys, we don't go with that. We could give it to him to give a bonus to hit, but look at that, 30 to 40 damage, 30 to 45 so a little bit more, 25 and 80%, 20 and 75. So this does a little bit more base damage and the bonuses are a little bit higher. So it actually ends up doing quite a bit more damage. It's a little heavier, eight fatigue and four, but right now we have such little armor, fatigue isn't really a problem for us. So I think we'll keep the sword as a spare. If we get more people, this will be a good beginner type weapon for somebody better than this crappy dagger these crappy cleavers and things and we'll head back we'll complete the quest and then we'll call it a wrap for this episode now they're still terrified the terrified vi villagers are from this quest which we'll probably end up doing next time and then, because we've completed two quests, the village will like us more, this will go away, they'll still be well supplied, and then we can buy some tools very cheaply, which will, again, economically help us in the long run, because we have to have tools, we're going to go through them. Ew, see, we're going to be under-equipped a little bit, but that's alright, we can be slightly damaged. Alright. Thanks for uh, watching. Hopefully it was educational. Let me know if you have any questions or anything else you want me to bring up, questions you have, and we'll go, uh, we'll uh, see you again next time.